34 for our message from the Word of God this morning. In the Pew Bible, you'll find Acts 10.34 on page 11.63. Today's date is November 8th, 2020. Today's text is going to be in Acts 10. Verses 34, right on down to the end of the chapter in verse 48. And the title of this morning's message is, Cornelius Gets Some Respect. <laughs> Cornelius Gets Some Respect. And as I'm sure you remember, Rodney Dangerfield was famous for getting no respect. He once said, My doctor told me that I was overweight. So I told him I wanted a second opinion. And he said, All right, you're ugly too. <laughs> He also once said, I don't even get respect at home. Last week, my house was on fire and the kids were screaming. And my wife told them, Quiet down or you'll wake your father. <laughs> wake your father, yes. Well, it's pretty bad. When even your wife doesn't give you any respect. But just imagine for a moment what it would be like if God didn't give you any respect. If you've been with us for the past few Sundays, you know we're studying the story of a Gentile named Cornelius. And if you know your Bible, you know that Gentiles like Cornelius went 1,500 years without getting respect from God. But here in Acts chapter 10, God showed Peter that that changed back in Acts 9 when he saved Saul of Tarsus and sent him to the Gentiles. And now Peter is going to tell Cornelius about the respect that God was now giving the Gentiles. With that in mind, I direct your attention to Acts 10 verse 34 where speaking to those Gentiles, Peter opened his mouth and said, <clears throat> Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, as a Jew who knew his Bible, Peter knew that back in the Old Testament, God was a respecter of persons. He respected the person of Jews, but not Gentiles. But after seeing that sheet vision earlier in the chapter, verse 34 here says that Peter perceived that God was no longer a respecter of persons. But now... There's something that I need to point out here so you don't get confused when you're reading the Old Testament. Because there's some verses back there that suggest 
that God wasn't a respecter of persons in the Old Testament, as you see in your first reference, where the king of Israel said to Israel's judges in Second Chronicles 19.5, Take heed what ye do, for you judges judge not for man, but for the Lord. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. But listen, the respect of persons that it's talking about there meant that God didn't respect the person of the rich over the poor. So he told his judges not to do that either. He was telling them not to let the the rich give gifts or bribes in order to get a, a more favorable judgment when they were judged. But while God was not a respecter of persons when it came to rich and poor, back there He was a respecter of persons of Jews and Gentiles. But now, as it says as we read on in Acts chapter 10, in our next verse in our text, in verse 35, now in every nation, not just in the Jewish nation, now in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, the fear of the Lord has always been where salvation has to start, folks. I know there's Christians who say that, oh, you shouldn't tell unsaved people uh, about hell and fire and brimstone. You shouldn't scare unbelievers with all that kind of talk just to get them saved. But down south they used to have a saying. It said... It's better to be hell scared than hell scorched, right? Yeah, so don't let that kind of talk make you back off from warning people of the of the eternal judgment to come. But in verse 35 when when Peter talked about working righteousness, that shows you that Peter might have known the Gentiles were no longer unclean, but he didn't know anything about Paul's new message of grace. Because work and righteousness, that's not something that we have to do today to be saved. But it was what men had to do to be saved under the law, as you see in your next reference in Psalm 15, 1 and 2. The psalmist prayed... Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And hills were types of the kingdom. And then he answers, He that walks uprightly and worketh righteousness. If a man wanted to be saved under the law, he had to work righteousness by doing what it says in your next reference in Psalm 4, verses 4 and 5. Stand in awe and offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Hey folks, standing in awe of God is that's just another way of saying fear God, right? Under the law, Jews had to fear God and work righteousness by bringing sacrifices of righteousness and doing all the other things that the law of Moses said to do. And that never changed for Jews under the law, as you see in your next reference. Because later John said in 1 John 2.29, everyone that doeth righteousness is what? Born again, born of God. But that was about to change for Jews and Gentiles who got saved under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. But Peter, he didn't know anything about that yet. So as we look back in our Bible now, 
he went on to talk about what he did know in verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. Now first, before we read on, notice that God sent Jesus Christ, it says there, to preach peace to the children of Israel, right? Have you heard any Christmas uh, hymns in the stores yet? I heard first one the other day. It's "Tis the season," and "Tis the season." We're about to hear your next reference, Isaiah nine six. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, and a bunch of other names, and the Prince of peace. But don't forget, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't come to offer that peace to anybody but the children of Israel. As it says in your next reference in Acts 5.31, speaking of Christ, Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince, like in the Prince of Peace, and a Savior, for to give repentance to, to everybody is that what you said? No! To Israel and forgiveness of sins. Christ came to be the Prince of Peace to Israel. And he, and he came to be their Savior, not the Savior of Gentiles. And you know what? That didn't change even at Pentecost. That's why Peter said at Pentecost in your next reference in Acts 2, 36 and 39, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that the promise is unto everybody, now unto you, you, the house of Israel. And he was talking about promises like Isaiah made. Those were made to Israel, not to the Gentiles. But don't forget also... That wasn't because God didn't like Gentiles. It was because He wanted Jews to get saved first. So He could use them to reach the Gentiles, as Peter goes on to say in your next reference. In Acts 3.26, speaking to those members of the house of Israel, Unto you first, God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning every one of you from His iniquities. You see that word first there? That means that God eventually planned to turn the Gentiles away from their iniquities too. But it had to happen with them first. But now, while God sent the Lord to the Jews... As we mentioned in our Sunday school this morning, uh, Sunday school, scripture reading this morning, while, the, while God sent his son to the Jews, the Lord made such a big splash in Israel that Gentiles like Cornelius, they couldn't help but notice it, as you see in verse 37 in, the, in your Bible. That word, I say, ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Those words you know there show that the Lord's ministry might have been to the Jews, but even Gentiles like Cornelius heard about it. Of course, they heard that it was only to the Jews. Shucks, even John the Baptist respected the person of the Jews and not the Gentiles. Uh, as, as Paul tells you in your next reference, in Acts 13.23, God, according to His promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus, when John had first preached before His coming, before His coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Israel. He limited his ministry to the Jews too. And, and here, listen, that is really significant because a lot of our Baptist friends think that the church, which is the body of Christ, made up of Jews and Gentiles, 
They think it began with John the Baptist. That's why they practice water baptism. But John preached to Jews, not Gentiles. And speaking of John, he's the one that helped God with something we read about in verse 38 in your Bible. (laughs) Uh, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and uh, with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Now when it talks about God anointed Jesus, you might remember when that happened. (laughs) God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost after he was baptized by John, right? Look at your next reference in Mark 1, 9 and 10. Jesus was baptized of John in Jordan and straightway, right away, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit, like a dove, descending on him, anointing him with the Holy Ghost. And that anointing is what gave the Lord Jesus the power to do good things like healing all that were oppressed of the devil, like the, even the Lord admitted in John 14.10, your next reference. He said, The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Remember, Jesus Christ didn't perform miracles. But the Father did. The Father did plenty of miracles by Jesus Christ, just like Peter said in your next reference in Acts 2.22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by Him in the midst of you. That's why here in verse 38 in your Bible, it says that God anointed Him with the Holy Ghost and power. Miracle working power. And that's why He adds in verse 38 that he went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That's how he healed them. Because God was with him. And I know it's unsettling to think that Christ didn't do miracles, but it's better to get yourself settled with what the Bible says than to try to deny it. Whenever I think of how the Lord didn't do his own miracles, I I always think of that old movie... Flash dance. How many remember flash dance? Ah, look at all the old people. Uh, it's about a young lady who was a welder at a steel mill in Pittsburgh. But she went on to be a professional dancer. And at the time the movie was out, all the women who saw the movie wanted to know if the actress in the movie did her own dancing. But all of us men wanted to know if she did her own welding. That's what we wanted to know. That's where, that's, if, if you'd ever tried to do any welding, uh, Rex was good at it, but not me. <laughs> but listen, the Lord didn't do His own miracles. And it's better to get settled with that. But did you know there's people who, who don't believe He did any miracles at all? Thomas Jefferson was one of them. Yeah. Just last week, somebody emailed me at BBS to ask if it was true that Jefferson rewrote his own version of the New Testament, omitting all of the Lord's miracles and and just leaving his teachings behind. And yeah, it's true. In fact, you could even... You can even buy a copy of Jefferson's New Testament online from Amazon <laughs> for, for the low, low price of eleven ninety five. I don't recommend it, but you can. But listen, the Lord Jesus Christ had witnesses to His miracles and Peter was one of them. That's what He goes on to say in your very next verse in Acts 10.39. He says, we are witnesses of all things which He did 
both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Now when it says that they were witnesses of the Lord, him and the, him and the other eleven apostles, don't forget the twelve didn't witness to people like you do. When you witness, at least I hope you do, when you witness, you do what it you tell them what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, right? Christ died for our sins. But that's not the gospel that the Lord ordained the twelve to witness to people, was it? In your next reference, when they went to pick a replacement for Judas, look what it says. Of these men, these uh, candidates for the twelfth apostle, of these men must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And later, the apostle Peter in Acts 2.32 said, This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. And then in Acts 3.12, You men of Israel killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised up, whereof we are witnesses. Peter was sent to witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But i got a question for you. Do you see anything in those verses that we just read about His resurrection paying for your sins? Like Paul says in your next reference in Romans 4, 24 and 25, Jesus our Lord was delivered for our offenses and what? Was raised again for our justification. The twelve apostles didn't preach that. They didn't preach the resurrection as good news. Let me ask you... If you were in one of those new movies, the the Marvel comic book superhero movies, and and somehow you managed to kill the most powerful superhero in the universe, then you heard he rose from the dead. Would you take that as good news? (laughs) No, you'd take that as bad news, at least for you. Because you'd know He's coming to get you. That's how the twelve preached the resurrection of Christ. They said, He's alive and He's coming back to get you. Even after Pentecost, Peter preached in Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hung down a tree. Him hath God exalted with His right hand And we are witnesses, His witnesses, of these things, of His resurrection. That's significant because Pentecost is when a lot of our other Baptist friends think the body of Christ began. But if it did, it began without any mention of Christ dying for our sins. The body of Christ actually began with Paul who was the first to talk about his death for our sins. But all Peter ever preached is, well, what we see as we read on in verses 40 and 41 in your Bible. Him God raised up the third day, as it says there, and showed Him openly. Not to all the people of Israel. Most of them rejected Him. So he witnessed, uh, he, he, he showed himself to witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now, here it, it's tempting to ask why didn't the Lord show himself openly to all the people of Israel? I mean, if he had. Maybe they'd have believed on him. I mean, think about it. If you killed a man who claimed to be God and then he rose from the dead, wouldn't you, wouldn't you believe him? <laughs> well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But what did the Lord Jesus say about that in your next reference in Luke 16.31? He 
said, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, what? Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You know what that means? That means when you get to thinking that if you could do a miracle, all your friends and loved ones would believe. When you get to thinking like that, just put yourself on the pay no mind list. <laughs> because God knows that's not how it works. And the Lord Jesus said so. Now, the Lord has a plan to show himself openly to all the people of Israel and all the rest of the world. It's called the second coming of Christ, right? That's when your next reference will come true. When the Lord comes in Revelation 1-7, every eye will see Him, and they also which pierced Him. And all kindreds of the earth will wail because of Him. Of course, when the Lord does that, when He shows Himself to all the people, it won't be to get them to believe. It'll, get them, it'll be to get them to wish they'd believed, right? When they had the chance. Now, in verse 41, when it says that the Lord ate with His witnesses, that's not just a casual throwaway thing. He did that on purpose to prove that He wasn't a ghost. That He had risen bodily from the dead. And that's important because you're going to hear people say, yeah, the Lord, He, he rose from the dead, and, and the way that He rose is that the Spirit of His teachings lives on. Did you ever hear that? No, it's not true. Up from the grave He arose, like we like to sing, with a mighty triumph o'er His foes. And if Christ be not risen, what? You are yet in your sins. Isn't that what Paul told the Corinthians? Of course, that's not what the Lord told Peter to tell the Jews. As you see as we read on now in verse 42, after He rose from the dead at the end of verse 41, He commanded us to preach to the people, and the people is always the people of Israel, and to testify that it is He which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Listen, after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, He did not tell Peter to tell the people of Israel that He was raised to be their Savior. He told Peter to tell them He was raised to be their judge. Isn't that what it says? Of course, it's not like He didn't have any good news for the Jews, as you see in verse 43 in your Bible. Speaking of Christ, it says, To Him give all the prophets witness that through His name whosoever believeth in Him shall receive remission of sins. Now remember, faith in the Lord's name was all they had to have to be saved. Because His name was Christ. And what does it say in your next reference? John twenty thirty one. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that she might have life, what? Through His name. Isn't that what verse 43 says? Through His name, whosoever believeth in Him will receive remission of sins. But what does Paul say you have to have in Romans 3.25? Faith in His name? Faith in His blood. Plus... If you wanted to obtain the remission of sins that Peter offered the Jews, they had to do more than just believe on his name. There was another step that he told them about in Acts 2.38. Peter said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And we know that is the only gospel he ever preached. Because even after he found out from Paul that Christ died for our sins, look what he preached in 1 Peter 3.21. Baptism doth also now save us. And I know I harp on this a lot, but the reason I harp on it is to remind you that Peter's message was different from Paul's 
right from the get-go, right from the very gospel of salvation that they preached. And that means you shouldn't be looking to Peter's epistles after you're saved to learn how to live your life. But now, don't forget the overall picture. Don't forget what God is doing here in Acts chapter 10. He's using Peter to introduce Paul's new message about the dispensation of the mystery. A dispensation in which water baptism would no longer be required for the remission of sins. A dispensation that interrupted God's prophetic program for Israel. And what better way to introduce that interruption than to interrupt Peter before he got a chance to tell Cornelius to get baptized. And you know what? That's what God did in verse 44. Look at verse 44 in your Bible. While Peter yet spake all those words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Well, as you can see, God didn't let Peter tell Cornelius how to be baptized to get the remission of sins like he did at Pentecost. He filled those Gentiles with the Holy Spirit first. And that is not how things were supposed to happen. It was supposed to happen like the fuller version of Acts 2.38 I gave you there, where it says, he told them, be baptized for the remission of sins, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were supposed to get baptized first, and then get the Spirit. And that's, that's one of several reasons why Peter, as we read on in verse 45, why he was astonished... Verse 45 says, They of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter was astonished for several reasons. He was astonished that anybody would get the Spirit without getting baptized first. But he was also astonished that Gentiles would get the Spirit at all. And the third reason he was astonished is that, listen, he hasn't been preaching the gospel to those Gentiles. He'd just been telling them what he preached to the Jews. Let me put it this way. Peter, in this passage that we just read, he hasn't been giving what we learned about in speech class. Remember, uh, did you ever hear of a motivational speech? <laughs> Peter has not been giving a motivational speech trying to motivate those Gentiles to believe on Christ. That's not what he's been doing. He's been giving an informational speech, just telling them how the Jews were saved. He didn't expect. God to start saving Gentiles before the Jews were all saved. So he was astonished that God did. Now, you say, well, how did Peter know that the, that the, the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on those Gentiles? Well, that's what we find out in verse 46 in your Bible. For they heard them speak with tongues. And magnify God. Well, hey, isn't that, isn't that what happened when the twelve were filled with the Spirit in your next reference? They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. By the way, when it says in your Bible there that they spoke with tongues and magnified God, you know what that shows you? That shows you that when men speak in tongues in the Bible... They didn't speak in gibberish like they do today. When men speak in gibberish, you can't tell if they're magnifying God or moaning about the bears and how they've lost the last couple of games. For all you know, that's what they're doing. Right? Moaning about the election, whatever. <laughs> but now, what would you do in this situation if you were Peter? And what was happening in your world 
just didn't seem to make any sense. Well, what he did is a good example for us to follow. When things in our world just don't seem to make any sense. Because what he did, well, let's begin in verse 46 and just read on through the end of the... He says, Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then, of course, they asked him to stick around a while. They prayed him to tarry certain days. When Peter saw that things just weren't adding up, he stood firmly on the Word of God and did what the Lord told him to do and baptized Cornelius and his loved ones. In other words, he stuck with the Word of God to him, right? He didn't know anything about the new change. Is there anything you can learn from that? When things in your world don't compute, remember we used to say that this does not compute? When things in your world don't compute, you can't go wrong if you just stand on the Word of God written to you in Paul's epistles, like Peter did to him, with the Word written to him. What Peter was thinking was, well, it wasn't supposed to happen this way. <laughs> They weren't supposed to get the Spirit before being baptized, but they did! So, can anybody think of a good reason why we shouldn't baptize them anyway? Nobody could! <laughs> so they did! They did what the Lord told them to do. But before we close, we have to ask, why did God give the gift of tongues to Gentiles in the first place? We, we know from your next reference why He gave the gift of tongues to the Jews. It was because someday ten men will take hold out of all languages of the nations, of the Gentiles, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So God gave the Jews the gift of tongues so they could give the gospel to men of other tongues. But there'd be no reason to give the gift of tongues to those men of other tongues. So why did God do that? Well, later, the Apostle Paul explained it in your next reference. When the Corinthian Gentiles started speaking in tongues, and they started thinking that they were all that because of it. <laughs> they, they were all puffed up and... And in your next reference, Paul, let's just say he lets all the hot air out of their puffed up balloon <laughs> when he told them in 1 Corinthians 14.22, tongues are for a sign. Paul's telling them, God is just using you as a sign to somebody. He's just using you to deliver a message. He's just using you to give somebody a sign. And who might that be? According to your next reference in 1 Corinthians one twenty two, the Jews require a sign. God gave the gift of tongues to the Corinthian Gentiles just to give a sign to the Jews. You say, well, a sign of what? A sign that God's judgment had fallen on the Jews for crucifying the Lord and stoning Stephen. And you see that in your last reference, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 21. When, the, when Paul explained the gift of tongues in Corinth, he said, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, the people of Israel. And yet, for all that, will they not hear me saith the Lord. In the law, God wrote to the Jews, it is written to the Jews, when you start hearing Gentiles speak in tongues, when you start hearing Gentiles speak to you in tongues, that'll be a sign that you haven't been listening to me, you haven't been hearing me when I spoke to you in Hebrew. 
So I got to speak to you through them. It was a sign of judgment. When God took the Jewish gift of tongues and gave that Jewish gift to the Gentiles, that was a sign that God was judging them. And now you're thinking, well, if that's true, shouldn't Gentiles still speak in tongues today? I mean, doesn't God still want Jews to know that He's judging them? No, He doesn't! That is not what God wants, God wants Jews to know today under the grace message. That was Peter's job during the transition from law to grace. But our job is different. Our job is to let Jews know that God loves them and Christ died for them and that they can be saved just like Gentiles by believing God loves them and Christ died for them without being baptized, without works of righteousness or anything like that. Amen? Amen.